Number five. I got four right here. This is four. All right, here we go. Now we're going to pray that uh, folks are just on their way in. Amen. It's rainy. It's cold. It's a Monday night. But uh, here's the deal. I learned a long time ago. You do not get upset about those that are not here. You praise the Lord for those who are here. And uh, so we're here. We'll have a good time. And uh, we're going to sing to get it started. And when I say we're going to sing, we're going to sing. <laughs> My wife is so happy. He paid us each $5. I figured tonight's the one night to do it. Ain't nobody here. Praise <laughs> God. Amen. <laughs> Oh, once I wandered in sin's black night And there was no way I could make my wrongs right Then that old accuser to the Lord did cry He is a sinner and now he must die then i heard a voice saying father i'll go i'll pay his sin debt to calvary's flow i'll bear in my body the marks of the cross to save that child who is sin sick and lost. And it's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within. From the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea, it is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me. Now there are those who rely on the works that they do, and some men will count on the times they prayed through oh but when the battle's over and the last song is sung i'll go home through the blood of the father's precious son and it's still the blood that saves from sin it's still the blood that cleanses within From the highest star in heaven To the depths of the sea It is still the blood of Jesus That brings victory to me And it's still the blood that saves from sin it's still the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea it is still the blood of jesus that brings victory to me from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea. It is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me. Aren't you? thankful for the victory that we have in Jesus. Let's start by singing together about that victory tonight. Now there's not a lot of you, so you got to sing double time tonight, all right? Stand up with me. Turn to page 341 on the first now. I heard an old, old story. I heard an old, old story. 
how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Sing it now. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the Let's sing that second now. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and he calls the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing now on this third verse listen now it says i heard about a mansion i don't know what home you left tonight but i doubt it was a mansion but we can look forward to one one day amen so let's sing this third now i heard about a mansion all together now i heard about a mansion he is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood we're actually singing really well tonight. Let's sing this next one together as a song of praise to our God. Page 465, How Great Thou Art. Sing with me now on the first. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down, from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art 
how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Think about this next one. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin sing it then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou. We'll sing this last verse when we get to the chorus, Miss Rebecca, drop out there. Here we go. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow with humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Wonderful Dr. Sal Yanizzi is here tonight. If he'd come, he's the pastor of the Bible Baptist Church in Bradenton, our friend, and doing a great job in Bradenton. We praise the Lord for him. I want him to come and lead us in our opening prayer. Brother Sal. Let's pray together, may we? Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We love you tonight. Looking forward to a great meeting. We pray you touch this place and touch these people. Touch this preacher in a special way. Anoint them and fill them with your presence and power and use them in our lives. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have anybody tonight, this is your first time or first time in a long time at Community. Good to have a friend of Ryan's here. God bless you. Anybody else, first time in a long time? Everybody else looks like mostly home folk. Uh, Brother Chad, Brother Ryan's friend back there. Good to see Josh. He was under the weather Sunday and uh, still looks a little frail. And we, Oh, that's just normal. Good. All right. Well, let's do this. About two minutes. <clears throat> singing about two minutes uh, I want to get around and smile at somebody good to have you sir brother uh, Dan's dad is here tonight good to see you've been praying for you and your family and I just praise the Lord for you here tonight I'm gonna get around shake somebody's hand smile be nice Rebecca play us through a song and then we'll come back and sing one more before we get to the Hensons God bless you we're glad you're here All right, as you're finding your way back to your seat there, let's sing another great hymn this evening. 
Page number three, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Sing with me now on the first. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me. Now this one's a good one. Sing it. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. All right, you may be seated. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if I can explain how much we love the Hensons, but we uh, as a family just appreciate their ministry and their testimony. I want them to come and sing about a half a dozen or so songs and just get us ready for preaching tonight and uh, just love them, love their spirit and uh, love their attitude, love just being around them. We have such a good, I don't know of anybody I laugh and cut up with more than when I'm around Brother Roger and the family. And most of it is picking on Renee, so it's a great privilege and pleasure. But uh, you enjoy them as they get ready to sing. And then I'm going to go ahead and introduce our preacher tonight. Dr. John Hamlin has been preaching for 35 years up and down the country. And I've known him for 20 of those years. And uh, we've, uh, dear friends, we've been together for a long time. And so the Hensons are going to sing. And then uh, right after they're done, Dr. John Hamlin is going to come and uh, preach to us tonight. We're looking forward to it. You listen as they sing. Sad and alone. 
song we're going to do, we don't have to, uh, to us, the only Bible there is is the King James Bible. And this song talks about loving that old Bible. It doesn't say King James in it, but that's exactly what it is. It is the book, and I'm thankful for that. But we do love our Bible, and that's what this song talks about. What light is this shining so bright? Dreams almost gone. Thanks him determined just to keep plodding on. But sweet consolation from heaven's bright throne. God's wonderful book, Diva. So 
what we do is we bring our old song book <laughs> with old songs that we sang it for. And they seem to appreciate that. The Bible. This song we're going to sing here is, I may have told you this last time, this girl, but this is our son went home to be with the Lord. Now it's been a little over five years, I guess, since he went home to be with the Lord. He was a big part of our singing. And our family, and we miss him and love him. Every day we miss him. But this song was one of his favorite songs out of the songbook. But he sang this eight days before he went home to be with the Lord at his grandmother's funeral. So it was a blessing to us. And we want to sing it. To trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same. some trouble in my short days through it all I had no fear see I had a friend who's always near if the sun were to fall if the oceans were to dry if the mountains were
And if the sun were to fall, if the oceans were to dry, if the mountains were to crumble, I wouldn't bat an eye. Bibles, the book of First John, chapter number two. This is a marvelous Monday night crowd. We thank the Lord for each of you that are here. And I feel like old Mays Jackson, who said about services like this, it's a slice of spiritual strawberry shortcake. I've enjoyed the Henson family all day yesterday and again tonight. And I'll be quick to tell you that they are some of my favorite singers. Uh, I have been working in uh, meetings and conferences with the Henson family for the 35 years now that I've been saved, preaching, and in full-time evangelism. 35 years we've known the Hensons, and not one single time have we ever had a falling out. I think that that is fundamental history. I really do. And I've enjoyed being here these days. And then the privilege to preach for uh, my dear brother, I love him like a brother in the flesh. Dr. Brent Stansel is such a blessing. Uh, I am forever grateful for that day in Pontiac, Michigan, when God allowed our paths to cross and I believe knitted our hearts together. Uh, the Stansels have been in our home and I've been in their home, and they're not acquaintances, they're not associates, but they're actual friends. And I'm always excited and elated when I get to come and be uh, with family. Thank you, Dr. Stansel, for having me. I appreciate so much the comfortable motel room, the delicious meals, uh, the warm times of fellowship, every act of kindness, the book that I stole from your library just before the service tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being so kind to me as I've been here. Book of 1 John, chapter number 2. Such a blessing to have my dear friend, Dr. Sal Yanizzi, uh, in the service tonight. Uh, and I'm also... Also happy to have Brother Mike Malone in the service as well. Uh, Dr. Yanizzi is like family also and have preached many times uh, when he pastored uh, in Philadelphia and down in town. And uh, I appreciate so much Dr. Yanizzi, Brother Malone being in the service. I'm always honored and humbled when men of God take time out of their busy schedules to be with me in a meeting. The word busy doesn't even come close in describing or depicting a preacher's life. So thank you, Brother Malone. Thank you, Dr. Yanizzi, my dear, precious friend, for being in the service tonight. I'll tell you a funny story. Years ago, I was preaching for Dr. Yanizzi, and Dr. Lou Rossi was with me preaching in a conference, and your pastor, uh, Dr. Stancil, called me. And uh, Dr. Yanizzi and Dr. Rossi and I were having a meal uh, at uh, an Italian restaurant. And I took the call. And uh, Dr. Stansel said, uh, are you busy? And I said, well, I'm having dinner with uh, Yanizzi and Rossi in an Italian restaurant. And your pastor said, well, that means someone will be sleeping with the fishes before the morning comes. First John chapter number 2, and I'll take but one verse of Scripture for our text, and it will be verse number 28. Book of First John chapter 2 and verse number 28. Now, I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. Book of 1 John, chapter 2, and verse number 28. And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If my count is correct, there is in this verse a nine-word phrase that I wish tonight should underline 
if not in your Bibles, then certainly in your minds. I've underscored it in my Bible, and it's the nine-word phrase, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Do you see it? There it is. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. For a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject tonight, how to keep from being ashamed at Christ's coming. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If I know my heart, I want to be a blessing. But the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts tonight, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I am away. Give us fresh warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from tonight. And Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. And if I can get our dear brethren to give me a little bit more sound in the sound booth, I'd greatly greatly, greatly appreciate it. I never preach this message, but what I feel like I need to mention, like Paul Harvey, page two, the rest of the story. And giving you the background and the backdrop of this message, about, uh, oh, uh, ten years ago, I was preaching in a great conference, and I'd come down uh, with bronchitis. And because of having pneumonia so many times, I immediately went to the doctor and he said that it was bronchitis and put me on some strong antibiotics. Within 24 short hours, that bronchitis had turned into pneumonia. I went back to the doctor. I'd left by then the conference and was now in a revival meeting. And I said to our family doctor, I believe that the bronchitis is pneumonia. He said, you cannot self-prescribe pneumonia. But he said, I'll take a chest x-ray and I'm sure it is still the bronchitis. They took the x-ray and a little bit he came back and he said, congratulations, you're right, it is pneumonia. Because I'd had it so many times, he said, we're going to put you in the hospital and you will spend a week in the hospital. I said, all right, but I want to uh, make a deal with you and that is this, I'm in a revival meeting. And so what I'll do is I'll spend the day in the hospital. At night, I'll check myself out, I'll go preach, and when I get done preaching, I'll check myself back into the hospital. He smiled and said, that sounds like a good deal. And he took out of his uh, uh, lab coat a prescription pad. He wrote something down on it, gave me it, and said, when you get to the hospital, be sure and give this note to the head nurse. I said, I will. I got to the hospital that afternoon, intending to preach that night and the rest of that week in a revival meeting. I made the mistake of giving the head nurse the note. She looked at it, smiled, and said, we can do that, and then took my clothes. <laughs> Put them in a locker and did not give the combination to me and returned with what they called a hospital gown, but I would call it an immodest miniskirt. <laughs> and so since I preach against miniskirts, I certainly couldn't preach in a miniskirt. And they had my clothes, and I spent a whole week of my life in the hospital when I wanted to be in a pulpit. Mrs. Hamlin asked if there was anything she could bring me, and I said, yes, my Bible, a legal pad, and a pen. And well, in the hospital that week, God gave me this message I'm going to try to preach tonight. For a decade, I have carried it in my briefcase across America, wanting to preach it. But it wasn't until in my meetings this year that the Lord gave me the green light to preach it. Nothing could be any more of a Bible enigma than an embarrassed believer. But 
from one end of the globe to the other, red will be the face of many a child of God when the horn blows and the Son of God returns on a chariot of clouds for his own. Shame-faced is an expression that never looks becoming on a saint. How to keep from being ashamed at Christ's coming. In the book of 1 John chapter 2, we find little children warned against apostates who deny the true deity of Christ. Five times in this block of Bible, one finds that unique expression, little children. The first time is in verse 1. The second time is in verse 12. The third time is in verse 13. The fourth time is in verse 18. And the fifth and last time that one finds that unique expression, little children, is in our text. This chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this. John writes about the Savior, verses 1 through 2. John writes about the surety, verses 3 through 14. John writes about the sinful society, verses 15 through 17. John writes about the satanic order, verses 18 and 19. And then John writes about the spirit, verses 20 through 29. It is well the apostle John is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with John writes about the spirit that a person reads a heart-moving nine-word praise. Verse 28, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The word ashamed in the Greek language means to feel shame not for another, but to feel shame for oneself. Evangelist Oliver B. Green once penned about our text, if Jesus should come today, would we be ashamed to stand before him, ashamed of what we have done for him and what we have given him? Never forget the sobering truth. He is coming and his own will stand before him. We'll straighten up a lot of the slackness, silliness, and sinfulness that goes on this hour. Now, if you miss everything that I preach tonight, I pray that you not miss that. And it even bears repeating the sobering truth, the sobering truth, the sobering truth. He is coming and his own will stand before him, will straighten up a lot of the slackness, silliness, and sinfulness that goes on this hour. Friend, you and I, those of us that are saved, need to know how we can keep uh, from being ashamed uh, at his coming. Now, although we do not know the day or the hour or the minute or the second, I believe I'm in Bible ground in saying that we are closer now than we've ever been to the return of the Lord. I believe I'm on Bible ground in saying that. Uh, it may not be uh, very long, but what the horn blows. In fact, the Lord could come back uh, before I finish uh, this sermon. The Lord could come back before we finish this service. The Lord could come back before I finish this statement. He is coming. He is returning. He is coming. And you and I need to find out how we can keep uh, from being abashed uh, at his appearing. Now quickly, let me give you tonight three ways every believer can keep from being red-faced at Christ's coming. And they're all found here in 1 John chapter 2. Let's quickly notice it tonight. Now you may want to take out a pencil and somewhere uh, in your Bibles write these things down, but my, how it would be far better if God were to take an eternal pen and write these things upon my heart and upon your heart as well. How to keep from being ashamed at Christ's coming. Number one, love the family. Verse 10, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. A way every believer can keep from being red-faced at Christ's coming is to love the family. In verse 10, the apostle John tells us that the child of God is commanded to adore his brothers and sisters. 
the master artist of the Holy Spirit paints an unforgettable word picture between the first word and the final word of this scripture by portraying one who loves his spiritual kinfolk remaining under a radiance that removes uh, uh, all possible spiritual spills of all sorts and sizes. Dr. John R. Rice once stated about this same truth, poor living makes poor assurance. Therefore, one who hates his brother has no assurance of his salvation, though he might be saved. The favorite hymn of the believer that won't be ashamed at his coming is we may have unfading splendor when love shines in uh, a, a friendship true and tender when love shines in when earth's victory shall be won and our life in heaven begun there'll be no need of sun when love shines in the unknown poet was spot on when he penned love is an atti attitude <clears throat> Excuse me, love is an attitude. Love is a prayer for a soul in sorrow, a heart in despair. Love is good wishes for the gain of another. Love suffers long with the fault of a brother. Love gives water to a cup that's run dry. Love reaches low as it can reach high. Seeks not her own at the expense of another. Love reaches God ha, when it reaches our brother. Friend, you and I can keep uh, from being red-faced uh, at Christ's coming uh, by loving the family. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 1, let brotherly love continue. The believer that is rapture ready is never too faced with others down at the church house. Won't air all their dirty laundry on social media. Now can we pause right there for station identification? <laughs> if you cannot control your emotions, you have no business on Wastebook. Did I say that out loud? I have such a hard time, Mrs. Stancil, figure out what I say out loud and what I say in my head. Mrs. Hamlin says you say everything out loud and nothing in your head. <laughs> if you cannot control your emotions, you have no business uh, on Facebook. You have no business on Twitter. You have no business uh, on YouTube. You have no business on Instagram. You have no business to even light a fire and send up smoke signals if you can't control your emotions on social media. Do you realize that the internet is the worldwide bulletin board? Which means God is not within a hundred miles of Facebook fights, Twitter tournaments, and blog battles. I was preaching recently in a Bible conference and a college student asked me during a Q&A, Dr. Hamlin, do you have a blog? To which I replied, I have published books. You have to pay to read me. I'm not free. <laughs> the believer that is rapture ready is never too faced with others down at the church house, won't air all their dirty laundry on social media, and never holds hard feelings towards any of God's people because of an offense that's as old as the dust in King Tut's tomb. He is coming. He is appearing. He is coming, and we need to love the family. Back in the spring, and I'll not give too many details, and you'll understand why in a moment. I was preaching in a great conference. And they had brought into that conference not only uh, three speakers, including myself, but a special singer. And on Monday night, Dr. Yanisi, I had the first slot. The rest of that conference, I had the second slot. But that Monday night, I had the first slot. And if you're in a conference and you have the first slot, then what you do is um, you do your thing, chicken wing and you sit down and the second preacher comes and preaches and gives the invitation. And so in that first slot I just went ahead and got up and preached and then I went and sat down with the Hanson 
And the second preacher got up to preach, and during the invitation, I mind you, they had brought in uh, three speakers, including myself, had brought in a conference soloist, and during the invitation, I was on the front row, and all of a sudden, I sensed uh, someone standing extremely close, and when I opened my eyes, there stood the conference soloist. He was standing so close we could have shared the stay, the same stick of Wrigley Spearmint gum. I mean, he was standing that close. I opened my eyes, there he stood. He had tears in his eyes, and he said, Dr. Hamlin, while you were preaching tonight about he's coming, he's returning, he's coming, and how we're to love the family, he said, God took me down memory lane, and he said, God reminded me, and God rebuked me that years ago I mistreated you, and I mistreated your family. I said, my brother, thinking back on it, I probably unintentionally hurt you and hurt your family as well, and I'm sorry. He looked at me and said, no, sir, you didn't hurt me, you didn't hurt my family. He said, but I hurt you, and I hurt your family, and I need to make it right. I said, my brother, as thin as a piece of paper is, it still has two sides, and I'm sure I played a part. He said, no, sir, you didn't play a part. Now, will you get the picture for a moment? Here he's trying to make it right, and we almost got in a fight over whose fault it was. Oh, yeah, you better believe we're Baptists. Finally, after we went back and forth over whose fault it was, I looked at him and said, my brother, there's the altar. Let you and I go pray and get it under the blood. And there, something had been taken care of that for years was not right. And Brother Henson, I so appreciate you apologizing. That's awesome. (laughs) Oh, we need to love the family. We need to love the family. We need to love the family. He's coming. He's returning. He's coming. Love the family. And Alexander the Great became a world conqueror. And by the way, am I the only one that's been wondering about that little child that's with brother and sister Hanson? What is up with that? That's a wonderful family portrait, Abraham and Sarah. That's just friend of yours, baby. Okay, I've just been wondering. I thought maybe you had an announcement you wanted to make and didn't know how to do it, and so you put it on your publicity photo. That's Abraham and Sarah up there. When Alexander the Great, been wanting to do that since this meeting started. When Alexander the Great became a world conqueror, he decided to have his portrait painted in oils. The finest artist in, his, in the realm was called to produce a flattering masterpiece. When he arrived at Alexander's court, the renowned general requested that the portrait be of a full-face pose instead of a profile. This filled the artist with great distress, for one side of Alexander's face was hideously disfigured by a long scar, the result of a battle wound. After studying his subject for some time, the painter came up with a happy solution. First, he seated Alexander at a table. Then, placing the general's elbow on it, he asked him to cup his chin in his hand. As a final thoughtful gesture, the artist adjusted Alexander's fingers so they covered his unsightly scar. And with brushes and paint, he produced a a wonderful likeness of the general. Hey, Christian, you won't have to be concerned about being ashamed at his appearing when you give your time to covering your brother's and sister's scars rather than calling attention to them. He is coming. He is appearing. He is coming. And we need to love the family. Number two, let me hasten still in 1 John chapter number two. Number two, please look at it. Loathe the fleeting. Verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. A way every believer can keep from being red-faced at Christ's coming is to loathe the fleeting. In verse 15, the apostle John tells us that the child of God is counseled to abhor this world and its wicked systems. 
D.L. Moody wrote in his Bible next to this verse the words, the world is like a floating island and as sure as we anchor to it, we will be carried away by it. Uh, don't miss this please the world in this passage of scripture is not the planet on which we live or the natural creation about us rather it is the system which man has built in an effort to make himself happy without Christ friend you and I uh, can keep from being red faced uh, at Christ's coming by loathing the fleeting now there's several important things that the Christian should remember about the world every day of the world. And it may shock you, it may stun you, it may even surprise you, but first of all, it is crazy. John 7, 7, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. An important thing that the Christian should remember about the world, every day of the world, it is crazy. It is 100% psychotic to despise the only person who can help today, tomorrow, and 10 million forevers from now. We're living in an hour when in our nation there's animal rights. And there's children's rights. And we're living in an hour in our nation where there is what they call gay rights. But friend, that is a lifestyle that never makes anyone happy so they're not gay rights. And on the heels of that, let me say it's bad when a country goes to the dogs. It's worse when a country goes to the poodles. Oh, bow your head. I'm not closing in prayer. And so we have animal rights, we have children's rights, we have so-called gay rights. But you go ahead and pass out a gospel tract. You go ahead and stand on a street corner and quote half of a Bible verse. You go ahead and pray uh, anywhere and almost it's to the point in our country, it's almost to the place in our land uh, that they want to haul you away uh, and put you in a rubber room and in a white coat. It only goes to prove that this world is absolute. It's crazy. Secondly, if it's not crazy, what do you call uh, their murdering babies in the same building where you try to save lives? If, if you don't think this world is crazy, what do, what do you call uh, their uh, outlawing um, drinking and driving, but they're selling gasoline and liquor in the same building. If you don't think this world is crazy, then why is it that they legalize uh, cannabis? Say, so what's cannabis? Well, it's, it's Satan's spinach. It's Lucifer's lettuce. It's wacky tobacco. So those little cigarettes will get you in trouble every time and the munchies too. Say amen right there. If you don't think this world is crazy, then why is it that they outlaw, uh, well, they say that you can uh, sell cannabis, but then they say there are places you can't smoke. Yeah. It only goes to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that this world is crazy. Secondly, it is corrupt. 1 John 5, 19, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Uh, uh, an important thing that the Christian should remember about the world, every day of the world, it is corrupt. It doesn't take a spiritual Sherlock Holmes to pull out his magnifying glass to pick out the fingerprints of unscrupulous behavior on this planet. It is corrupt. Thirdly, it is the cause for casualties. In 2 Timothy 4, 10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Only important thing the Christian should remember about the world, every day of the world, is the cause for 
casualties, flirting and falling in love with the trends and trinkets of today have knocked out of the fight far too many spiritual troops. If you don't think the world's the cause for casualties, ask the Sunday school superintendent who will tell you you can hardly get a new Sunday school teacher to make it to the first teacher's meeting without blowing out. If you do not think that this world is the cause for casualties, then just ask the choir director or the song leader and he will tell you you can hardly get a new choir member or a new soloist or a new member of the quartet to make it from uh, the Christmas cantata to the Easter extravaganza without blowing out. If you don't think this world is the cause for casualties, just ask the pastor who can tell you you can hardly get a new convert baptized and dried off, but what they disappear, you can't find them, the mall police can't find them, and the FBI can't find them either. You know why? This world is the cause for casualties. All oh, that every, every, every Christian that was in this service tonight would realize uh, that the important things that we need to remember about the world, every day of the world, uh, it is crazy, it is corrupt, uh, and it is the cause for casualties. Certain titled British gentleman was converted. He loved the Lord a great deal, but he was not well taught in the Scriptures. He thought he could continue in some of his worldly engagements and still uh, bear a good testimony. On occasion, some weeks after he had given his heart to the Lord, this man accepted an invitation to a very worldly party. Upon his arrival, one of the guests greeted him with these words, I'm so glad to see you and to know that it isn't true. I beg your pardon, he replied, but I think I don't quite understand you. Why, said the other guest, rumors were around that you'd been converted a few weeks ago. I'm so glad that you're here and to know, therefore, the rumor was unfounded. But it's true, the dumbfounded man shouted, hesitating a moment, he added, I see that you think that this party is no place for a Christian to be, and you are right. You will never see me at such an affair, nor will anyone else. And bidding his host and hostess adieu, he departed from his last world's entertainment. Hey, Christian, you can't be the pal of the ball at all the world's entertainments and engagements without being extremely ashamed at his coming. He is coming. He is returning. He is coming. And we need to loathe the fleeting. And then number three, and last of all, my time is gone. Not only love the family, and loathe the fleeting. Now, I've been looking forward to this third point since the Lord laid this message upon my heart. Number three, and last of all, loose the fullness. Verse 27, but the anointing which he received of him abideth in you. A way every believer can keep from being red-faced at Christ's coming is to loose the fullness. In verse 27, the Apostle John tells us that the child of God is challenged to acknowledge the Holy Spirit's presence and power in their own personal life. The person stands, Dr. Inizzi, on the front door of verse 27. They still can see the back door of verse 20. But she have an unction from the Holy One and ye know all things. Hare Tori once said a very large portion of the church and their Christians claims for itself a very small part of that which God has made possible for them in Christ because they know so little of what the Holy Spirit can do for them and longs to do for us. There's no question that the songwriter 
had the same truth upon his heart when he penned one of my favorite songs in the hymn book, How I Praise Thee, Precious Savior, that Thy love lay hold of me, Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might Thy channel be, channels only, blessed Master, but with all Thy wondrous power flowing through us, Thou canst use us every day and every day. Friend, you and I can keep from being red-faced at Christ's coming by loosing the fullness. The Bible says in John 7, uh, 38, He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Can I go ahead and preach tonight? As the Christian and church of the 21st century has gone absolutely insane with every gadget and gizmo electronically. What we need more than anything is a new, is a fresh, is a vital dependence upon the third person of the Trinity who lives within our heart. It's almost like we're standing outside the door of Radio Shack, waiting for it to open up, to run in, to get something new. Now, friend, don't you misunderstand me. I have a website. And don't you misunderstand me. I'm on social media. And if you've been saved for like 50 years and have a note from your mother, you can read what I say. Don't you misunderstand me. I have a, a, a smartphone, but if I can go ahead and preach, here's the problem right now. The problem is technology without a touch. I mean, we've gone gadget and gizmo crazy. Do you realize that there is more, there is more, there is more power in this smartphone than the Apollo 11 that went to the moon. And that's the problem. Don't you, don't you misunderstand me. Don't, don't, don't you misunderstand me. I, hey, I got a website. I'm on social media. I've got a smartphone. In fact, right now, Mrs. Hamlin's texting me. I better get this. Hold on. <laughs> XO, XO, XO. She's wanted to play tic-tac-toe. We'll do that just as soon as I get home on Thursday. But friend, the problem is technology without a touch. We don't have to have the gadget. We don't have to have the gizmo. But we got to have God. Man, there's an app for everything. There's an app for this, there's an app for that, but I want to serve you notice there is no app for old time power. You can't Google God. And what's happened is we've raised up a generation that thinks as long as I can Google this and Google that, I can get by. Friend, what we need is to realize we need God. We need His power. We need His touch. We need His breath. We need God. Am I the only one that has a problem when the house of God looks like the video arcade down at the mall? <laughs> no app. I'm trying to think which one you want me to tell. Yes, sir, I got it. Thank you. No app for old time power. You know the giants... The greats that are in glory. This, this is going to hair lip you, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. They got by real good without technology. Yeah. 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 Old Billy Sunday, he did, he did pretty good without technology. Right. D.L. Moody, he had a, pretty, had a pretty fair run without technology. Yeah. My mentor, God bless his sainted memory, Dr. Tom Malone Sr., yeah. what? 
he bought a cell phone. Man, it's an awesome story. I was on the way to the pulpit, and I took a moment and called him. He answered his house phone, uh, and I said, Dr. Malone, just checking to see if you need anything. He said, John, are you talking to me on, my, on your cell phone? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, could you hold on for just a moment? I said, absolutely. He said where I could hear him. He said, Joy, speaking of Mrs. Malone, this is John. He's called me on his cell phone. He said, Joyce, I can't wait till I'm a big preacher like John and have a cell phone too. If I'm lying, I'm frying. Tom Malone Sr. did pretty good without the newest gadget in Gizmo. What's happened is we are relying upon technology instead of the touch of God holding a revival meeting in Amory, Mississippi for a dear friend. Him knowing my love for fundamental history. And this is being told on the request of your pastor. He said, Dr. Hamlin, I want to take you by Myrtle. He said, you ever hear, you ever hear of Myrtle? I said, absolutely. That's where Dr. Percy Ray pastored and the great, the great Camp Zion existed. He said, exactly. He said, I want to take you uh, to Myrtle, Mississippi. And so on a Tuesday, I believe, he had rented uh, a limousine. Uh, to take me and the folks that were singing in that meeting a limousine. Uh, he had picked me every night up in the service in a Volkswagen, but, but had rented a, a limousine to take myself and those that were singing in that meeting with me to Myrtle, Mississippi. As we were coming up on Myrtle, he said, now Dr. Hamlin, he said, keep in mind, Myrtle is not even a dot on the map. He said, in fact, there's not even a stoplight. He said, but there's something I'm going to show you that you will never forget as long as you live. We pulled into Myrtle. He pointed to the great church where Dr. Ray pastored for so many years and then the great Camp Zion that was right there, a tabernacle that would seat, if I'm not mistaken, 3,000. The church ran in the heyday, maybe 300. Uh, the tabernacle would seat uh, uh, into the thousands, 3,000. It had a... It had a, uh, a um, bunkhouse, uh, well a men's dormitory, a ladies dormitory that would sleep 3,000. It, it, uh, uh, it had a lunch hall or a dining hall I should say that would feed 3,000. And he said this is what I want to show you. He said look across the street. I looked across the street and there Dr. Yanizzi was an old country store that looked like it was ready to fall in on itself. He said Dr. Hamlin I met Dr. Ray. He said there's no question the power of God was upon him. He said he was very unusual, but he had the touch of God. He went on to say that he had a personality. Well, he put it like this. A hymn book is more personable, closed, than Percy Ray. He said he was not a conversationalist. Another friend of mine had him for a meeting. He said that Dr. Ray before the service would sit on the front row and would have his Bible opened, but it would be upside down. And the preacher said, Dr. Ray, your Bible's upside down. He said, I know. I'm pretending I'm reading it so nobody will bother me before I preach. What do you think I was doing on the front row tonight? Very unusual. They had the power of God. And that preacher that I preached for said, Dr. Hamlin, there are eyewitnesses to this account. He said on a Monday morning, he said Dr. Ray would not shop on Sunday, not for milk, not for bread, not for anything, wouldn't even get gas on Sunday. But he said on that Monday morning to start the week, he crossed, by the way, the parsonage was right next to the church. He crossed the street to go to that country store. He's pointing to it. Looks like it's going to fall in on itself. He says there's witnesses to uh, testify to this. He walked in. He was standing behind a lady, a member of his church. She had bought some things. She didn't know Dr. Ray was there. Turned around and went to leave in a haste and ran right into Dr. Percy Ray. Dr. Percy Ray was a little bit on the mm, portly side. She ran right into him and then looked up and said, oh my Dr. Ray, I'm so sorry that I ran into you. She said, you know, he was a member of his church. She said, that sermon that you preached yesterday morning uh, on the Christian's testimony, she said it was great. And then the message that you followed up with that Sunday night on gossip was the best I'd ever heard you, Dr. Ray. And that preacher said, Dr. Hamlin, there's witnesses that Dr. Ray looked at that woman, a member of his church, and said, Ma'am, because you have no testimony and because you have run your mouth against the work of God, he said, Today your husband will come home. He 
should not only will your husband come home, but he will have with him a box. And in that box, there will be a blue dress from Sears and Roebuck. And he said, because of you running your mouth and because you hurt the work of the Lord and having no testimony, he said, ere the week is over, he said, you'll drop over dead and they'll bury you in that blue dress. She screamed. Oh, the color in her face was gone. She raced out of that country store. That preacher looked at me and said, Dr. Hamlin, there are witnesses. That man was not prone to do things like this. But he came home that night. He was a little bit late. He came through the door. He said, sweetheart, I'm sorry I was a little bit late. But I went by Sears and Roebuck and got you a gift. She opened the box and Dr. Henson, it was a blue dress. She screamed again. And ere that week was over, she was graveyard dead. They buried her in that dress. And Dr. Percy Ray preached her funeral you know what you call that the power of God and the problem in 2014 is we are so subnormal that if we ever got normal we'd be phenomenal don't you want to get back to the days where sinners would drive by the church and come under conviction and pull into the parking lot and hardly hit the brake, let alone put it in park and come racing into a service crying, what must I do to be saved? You see, there's some of us in this service tonight, and I'm not being harsh, God knows my heart, too few, but there are some of us tonight that have seen it on that fashion. So you're going to have to apologize or you're going to have to forgive us, I should say, when we're not impressed with the gadgets and gizmos. You're going to have to forgive us when we're just not absolutely doing cartwheels over what you can do. An old preacher put it like this that was preaching with me years ago and I've never forgot it. He said, if you're birth in the fire, you'll never be satisfied with the smoke. I remember Dr. Yanizzi. I was a teenage boy. Dr. Fred Schindler was having a revival meeting with Clyde Kendall. No doubt Clyde Kendall's in heaven. If you think I'm rough, I'm a lady speaker compared to Clyde Kendall. I was a teenager. I went to a revival meeting that was being held at the Landmark Baptist Temple in Exton, Pennsylvania. I was in high school. Mrs. Hamlin and I were high school sweethearts. I slipped into the back uh, row. Service was already underway. The place was jammed and packed. And while the congregation was singing, I could hear a little rumbling underneath the singing. And while Dr. Schindler was moderating the service, I could hear a little rumbling under the moderating. And while he was making announcements and taking the offering, I could hear a little rumbling under all that. Uh, and while the special music was going on, I could hear a little rumbling under that. And from that far corner, when it came time to introduce Clyde Kendall, uh, Fred Schindler said, our evangelist is coming to preach. I watched as Clyde Kendall got up from the corner, I wish somebody helped me preach, the corner of the platform where he had been on his knees praying out loud. I watched him as he got up. He took the pulpit. He looked at the crowd and he said, I'm not going to read my text. He said, God told me there are seven lost men in this service tonight. He said, I'm not going to read one verse of scripture until you seven men get saved. And I mean to tell you, one jumped up here and two jumped up there and three jumped up there and friend they didn't walk to the altar they ran to the altar so you'll have to forgive me when I'm not impressed with smoke and mirrors Amen. Amen. Dr. Stance and I were preaching in a great tent meeting in Detroit I kicked off that meeting on Sunday. He joined me Monday night to preach. On Sunday night after I preached, I'd ask the pastor, where he is? And I named a young preacher, young man that surrendered to preach under my ministry. I said, where is he? 
And the pastor said, Dr. Hamlin, I wish he could tell you he's in church. I wish he could tell you that he's on his bus route. I wish he could tell you he's preaching in, in, in junior church. He said, but he's out. I got a burden for that young man. Called to preach under my ministry, Brother Malone. And after I'd preached that Sunday morning, that Sunday night, fellowship with folks for a little bit, I slipped back under the tent. In a little while, the pastor said, where's Dr. Hamlin? And one of his men said, I'm not sure, but the last I seen, he was going towards that tent. And the pastor walked under the tent. I was already at the altar. He joined me at the altar. There was not one word that passed between he or I. And when I finished praying, not knowing he was there, he started to pray. And when he finished praying, I began to pray again. And when I got done praying, he prayed again. Soon the men of the church were looking uh, for us. And somebody said, well, I saw Dr. Hamlin going to the tent. And I saw Dr. Lawrence Mendez going to the tent. They must be under the tent. And before long, there's about 10 men under that tent. We weren't fellowshipping. Well, let me take it back. We were with an unseen guest. And those 10 men began to pray. I don't know how long we prayed, but all of a sudden I heard a young man start to weep. And the young man said, Lord, and it was the young preacher. He said, I'm coming to get right. He said, Lord, I've been out of church. And he said, I was walking past the tent in the back alley, and I heard my name being called, and I wondered what it was about. And, and he slipped up. This is better than you're letting on. He slipped under that tent, and in that prayer meeting, after being out in the world over six months, he got right with God. So you'll have to forgive me. I'm not really thrilled by the gadgets and gizmos that are often smoke and mirrors for the touch of God. Amen. Amen. Can I plow real tight? I remember as a young man, I would go to the conferences that now I'm preaching in. And I remember as a young man, you could just count on some preacher getting up and preaching on supplication. You could count on it. And I remember that you could count on some preacher getting up and preaching on soul winning. And I can, I can remember, you could just count on some preacher getting up and preaching on supernatural power. You could just count on it. Boy, there'd be like eight of us young preachers and we'd put all our money together. And I mean, we'd go to a conference and we'd get one room for eight of us. And we weren't staying where I'm staying these last couple days. Oh no, we were staying at Motel three and a half. Yeah. Motel six, they leave a light on for you. Motel three and a half, a roach checks you in. <laughs> and man, we'd pile into that motel. You remember Dr. Yanizzi, we'd pile into that motel room and we wouldn't sleep. Man, we'd get there early, we'd get a front seat. And we listen to those men of God thunder on supplication and thunder on soul winning and thunder on supernatural power. And by the time they got the supernatural power, we'd get back to that motel room. And as we were going to our room, we would pass other rooms and we would steal the do not disturb signs. I know it's wrong, but it's what we did. We'd steal the do not disturb signs. We'd get about 10 of them. We'd put them on that little doorknob. We'd pile into that room. We would throw the blanket over the television, we'd unplug it, we'd put the phone in the drawer, and we'd hunker down and big God for power. Now, excuse me, I'm preaching now in all those meetings, and it's almost, not altogether, but almost a missing note that you hear much about supplication soul winning and especially supernatural power he is coming he is returning he is coming and we must loose the fullness well preparing this message I asked the Lord to give me a visual of what it is to be filled with the Spirit. And I believe the Lord gave me this, which I want to share with you tonight. Let's imagine that that, I believe it is a 
grand piano, that that grand, grand piano represents whatever you and I do for God and good. So Brother Henson, for you and your family, it represents your meetings that you preach in, your family sings in. Dr. Yanizzi, for you, it represents a great Bible Baptist church that you pastor. For the Malone, Malone, for you, it represents the church now that you're pastoring. Dr. Stencil, for you, it represents that grand piano, uh, the great uh, uh, community Bible Baptist church that you pastor. For me, that grand piano represents my meetings and my conferences and the books that I author and everything that I do in trying to push a prodigal nation back to God. And our sister that's on the piano, the church pianist, is going to represent the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to represent the Christian. I can do that because there is one. I is one. And I want to try to give you a visual that we might never forget what it is to be filled with the Spirit. I can't play the piano. I can't. Our sister can. And so now she's playing. But having that piano represent all that we do for the Lord in whatever ministry we have, I'm going to sit down next to our sister who represents the Holy Ghost. I'm going to ask if she would stop playing for just a moment and I'm going to go ahead and show you how I can play with lessons the piano. You see, though I'm married to an accomplished and anointed pianist, at my very best, that's exactly what it sounds like when I play the piano. And the whole time seated next to me is someone who knows how to play. This is what it sounds like when you teach that class in the flesh. This is what it sounds like when you hold that revival meeting in the flesh. This is what it sounds like when, when you try to pastor in the flesh. This is what it sounds like when you try to win people to, to Christ. That's exa exactly what it sounds like. But the whole time we've got someone seated next to us who knows what he's doing. And you see on the piano keys of my life, there's not room for two sets of hands. There's only room for one set. And so he waits and he wishes and he wants for me simply to take my hands off the keys so he can begin to play. And when he does, go ahead, sis, this is what it sounds like. Oh, my Oh my, can anyone tell the difference? Doesn't it sound a whole lot, she continues to play, more melodious? Doesn't it sound a whole lot better when someone plays who knows what they're doing? And here's the grand and glorious thing, I get to sit here. I get to share the piano stool of my life with the Holy Ghost of God. And the only way it'll ever work is if I take my hands off the keys of my life and let him do what he knows how to do. Our sister continues to play. Felix Mendelssohn was a great organist, composer, and pianist of the Romantic period. Felix Mendelssohn, in fact, wrote a Midsummer's Night Dream. One day, Felix Mendelssohn went into a famed cathedral and asked, she continues to play, the organist if he could play their organ. The organist, not knowing Felix Mendelssohn, said, we do not let chance strangers play our organ. No. Felix Mendelssohn said, but I won't hurt anything. I, I just want to play, play your organ. And again, the organist said, no, finally, after Mendelssohn asked one more time, very calmly and politely, the organist said, well, if you have to, sir, go ahead. And Felix Mendelssohn sat down, and he began to play. And all of a sudden, that storied cathedral was filled with a melody and music like it had never heard before. And the organist 
tapped his shoulder and said, Sir, who are you? Mendelssohn said very simply, Felix Mendelssohn. And the organist began to weep and he said, What a fool I almost was. And not allowing the great Mendelssohn to play my organ. Can I go ahead and preach? What a fool I've been. Pardon me, but what a fool you've been. By the way, what a fool all of us have been for not allowing the Spirit of God to do what He does best. Amen. She continues to play. Please look again at our text. It's interesting. Oh, my. Is it a chapter that deals with apostasy? A chapter that deals with appearing. Don't miss it. Also is a chapter that deals with anointing. Which means this. When the Lord comes back, there's going to be fundamental Christians that told of the right Bible, went to a great church like this, but are going to be ashamed told of the right Bible, went to a great church like this, fundamental as the day is long, had two or three convictions. I wish to God they had two or three hundred, but two or three convictions. And they still are going to be ashamed because they have never loosed the fullness. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Our sister continues to play, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. How to keep from being ashamed at Christ's coming. I told a group of preachers this morning, Dr. Stansel had asked me to teach, and I don't take it lightly, his, one of his classes in a fundamental Bible college, and had a Q&A and a young preacher asked me, what's the thing you pray for the most? And I said, Dr. Yanizzi, now that I'm a grandfather and I, my oldest granddaughter is four years old, my youngest granddaughter is about six, nine months old. And I still, I got to be honest, I still can't wrap my head around the fact I'm a grandfather. I can't. But I said, outside of praying for my family and my grandchildren, the single thing I pray for more than anything else is the power of God. Isn't it interesting in a chapter that deals with appearing, that deals with apostasy, it also deals with anointing. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You may be here tonight and you've never trusted Christ. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He was buried for you. He rose again from the dead that you might be saved. And I wonder with heads bowed and eyes closed, who could lift their hand and say, Preacher, I know that I know that I know that I know that if I were to die right now, heaven is my eternal home. I'm saved and sure. You'd lift your hand and leave it. Saved and sure. Thank you. you. may put them down. You're here tonight, dear one, and you couldn't raise your hand, but you would lift it now, and by raising it, you're saying, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. Preacher, I don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. You'd lift your hand and say, pray for me. I need to be saved. You're here tonight, and as a Christian, God has spoken to your heart. And you'd say, preacher, I needed the message. I needed the message. Maybe there's someone that you need to make something right with. You know, I realize, Dr. Stan, so there's some things that only the judgment seat of Christ is going to iron out. I'm mindful of that. But that does not mean that I'm supposed to have a bad attitude from here to there. Oh, Sam Jones put it like this, I'll hold a grudge just as soon as I find a man who's treated God worse than how I've treated him since I've been saved. But I'll tell you what, if God starts holding grudges, we're all in trouble. I can forgive. 
because I've been forgiven. Love the family. Loathe the fleeting. Oh, but wait a minute. Loose the fullness. I wonder who'd lift their hand and say, Preacher, tonight I needed the message and God spoke to me. God bless you all over, all over, all over, all over. We stand to our feet. Heavenly Father, thank you for the kind attention of these, my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray that not one in any way would grieve, resist, or quench the Holy Spirit. May this be a time of great and glorious victory. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed as our brother begins to sing the hymn of invitation. Something you need to do, would you come? Out of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Our brother sings another verse. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy he is coming. help I'm come. He's returning. And I hope He's coming. By thy good pleasure. Before the service is over, before the statement is finished, he could return. We need to love the family. We need to loathe the fleeting. My, oh, my, how we need to loose the fullness. Just as our sister plays, our heads are bowed. If I can give you just one more thing. I asked Dr. Malone one day if he would write some things in my Bible between the Old and New Testaments. Most Bibles have some blank pages and if you're a preacher you put notes there and things that you don't want to ever forget. When Dr. Malone was in the last few years of his life, he and I were preaching together one night and after the service I gave him my preaching Bible and I said, Dr. Malone, if you don't mind, would you put between the Old and New Testament Testaments some things just some personal things to me that you want me to remember about the work of God. He said, be happy to do that. He said, can I keep the Bible for a couple days? I want to give some thought to it. I said, keep it as long as you want. And I don't know, after about two weeks, he and I were preaching together again somewhere, and he gave me back that Bible. And uh, I can't share everything that's on those blank pages. Well, they're not blank anymore. It's far too personal. But there was one thing that he said that so moved my heart that I uh, went to an engraver. I gave the engraver my money clip, and I said uh, on the front, it has my initials on it, I said on the back there's a little space. And I want you to put this down on the back of my money clip. Picked it up in about an hour. And I've carried that money clip since his home going in my pocket. And I never hit a pulpit, but what? I know it's in my pocket. Of course, in the front, it's got my monogram, my initials. On the back, it's just this statement. May your life be one of spirit-filled preaching. Tom Malone. Isn't it interesting, Dr. Stancil, when asking for words of advice that I might never, ever forget, A giant for God said something about the fullness of the Spirit. As the day gets more dark and more desperate, there needs to be a new dependence, not on gadgets and gizmos, but on the touch of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Something yet you need to do. Pastor comes and takes charge of the service. Would you mind God tonight? While uh, 
while Doc was preaching, I was thinking, Dr. Hudson said years ago one of the books that profoundly changed his life was a little small book entitled Deeper Experiences of Famous Christians. He said he read that book and he realized there was something missing in his life. It was that fullness. A lot of, a lot of different people call it different things, but the, the complete fullness of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, whatever term you want to use. I use the term total surrender where you just say that that's the giving. I, I look back, and I've told our church this a long time, two days in my life, the day I got saved, the day as a 22-year-old man, I said, Lord, my life is completely yours. Well, what a thought. I was thinking about those young preachers today. We really don't need to teach them anymore about leadership principles. We really don't need to teach them anymore about the latest keynote or PowerPoint or but we do need to teach them about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the, the anointing. I've heard all the, I mean, I, I've seen Dr. Malone preach, and I've seen him open up those windows. He wasn't no more in that building. Now, he was there, and there was nothing spooky or weird. Man, God was all over him. We talk about my wife's people, Roger's people. Boy, they know how to get hold of God. If you had to really get hold of God, could you really do it? That's what we need so desperately. We've gotten away from that. And I'll confess as your pastor, I've gotten away from it. We've looked to answers outside of the Holy Spirit the leading and the power of the work of God in our life is what we need more than anything else. We need to be sharp and we need to have the right deportment and character. All We understand that, but we must have a touch. And I thank Brother John for preaching that tonight. Let's pray together. God, as we close tonight and get ready to go home, may we not be able to rest. May we have no peace. May we have nothing that will satisfy us except and save for the filling of the Holy Spirit. I remember those same meetings that John spoke about tonight and remember Brother Howells and others getting up and speaking on the fresh anointing and the need for fresh oil, the need for the Spirit of God. I've, I've heard every one of them talk about there was nothing they could do outside the power of the Holy Ghost I'm so afraid that our generation has given over those terms to the charismatics and the Pentecostals and we, we're afraid almost to broach the subject of the spirit filled life and Lord we desperately need it thank you for a great message probably one of the best I've ever heard him preach just the anointing that's needed and Lord, we, I do believe you're coming. We live in the Noah days. And Lord, the Bible talks about in those last days, your spirit being poured out. And Lord, as we draw close, we are going to need the unction from the Holy One spoke of there in 1 John. So God, I pray you'd grant it to us. I pray tonight for our young preachers, those men we spoke to today, and those that follow us, that they would realize the great necessity of the spirit-filled life. Lord, I pray that we'd sense it, we'd see it, we'd realize it in our church. Thank you for the great, great message. Thank you for the help it's been to my heart. And Lord, I know I, I, sometimes you don't know what you need till you realize you just got what you needed. And I thank you for it. Bless now this time of worship and giving as we try to be an encouragement to the Henson family. And the Lord, to receive a love offering for the meeting. Lord, we thank you for their singing, their testimony, their influence in our life. Bless us as we travel home. Give us safety. Give us a great day tomorrow. In Christ's name, amen. I want you to be seated. Ushers, you come. I want you to give tonight. Everything we give the next, the tonight and tomorrow night will go toward the Henson's love offering. I'm going to ask uh, if uh, Kim will play for us, and then we're going to be dismissed. I'm going to have John come and say just a word.
uh, if you'd like to. Uh, Roger and Kay have some material there on the table. If you'd like to get some of that, Brother John has several preaching uh, CDs, several of his booklets back there, and his books, and uh, you take advantage of that. But uh, Roger told me this, and I, I want our church to respond well. Uh, we've learned how to give, and we've been doing well at that. But a couple of years ago, they started a new project, and they've not completed it. And I asked him yesterday, I said, how much do you need to complete the project? He said, we need about $2,000, and uh, that would give them the, a CD complete, a new CD. And uh, so I'd like our church to give above and beyond just the love offering. That, they have to live on their love offerings, but they need an extra couple of thousand dollars to finish this project. And uh, <clears throat> I was doing well, and I, I tell myself every time you come, I'm going to be better this time. But see, Micah, last meeting, big Micah, I thought about him. I hate the New England Patriots. Hate them with a passion. But they won yesterday. And I thought about Big Micah. He loved the Patriots because he loved that horrible Michigan quarterback. He loved him. And, and uh, Big Micah was sick. And we didn't know he was sick. In the last meeting after saying it was with us. finish this thought now and uh, Micah wrote so many songs and even now we're recording some of the songs that he wrote and uh, his young life was well spent and, uh, anyway I didn't mean to say that but I was thinking about that when I was saying that. so let's receive the offering and uh, let's give good tonight give good tomorrow night a good love offering for their expenses and their travel and then let's give above and beyond to help them finish this uh, latest project. Is this the first one y'all have done other than the memorial project? It's been a little hard on them to do a project. Because this is the first one without Big Micah. And so let's help them get that done so they can move forward. Lord, help us now in the giving. In Christ's name, amen.
great to be here. Well, I was looking forward to reading that book. Let's all stand together. And uh, tomorrow night, the Hensons will be singing and Brother Roger will be preaching. Brother Roger Henson, probably one of my favorite preachers living. And I still think about often uh, a sermon he preached years ago to us in Texas, uh, Too Much Lamb for the House, probably my favorite sermon he's ever preached. So tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, be here. We are having regular Wednesday service, 226, Master Club. Everything's regular on Wednesday night. But tomorrow night, we'll have Jubilee time with the Hensons. And uh, you love on Brother Hamlin. He's leaving. I love you. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. Call somebody. Invite them with you tomorrow night. And we'll have a great time. You're dismissed. God